and I'm a professor at the School of Population Public Health. And uh, I uptake and research utilization. So today's title is actually uh, my um, recent work in. Click on that and. Sorry, we're hearing a conversation at the back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can Hello? hear you. Can you, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So, um, so the topic today is uh, KT, and, and the work was done in particular to, uh, um, to, to be part of supportive cancer care and psychosocial oncology practice. And uh, the knowledge exchange decision support model um, is uh, what we've called it and uh, have been working on it for about three, four years now. So everybody, as soon as one mentions knowledge exchange um, then and knowledge translation, the first thing that comes to mind, okay, there we go with the slides. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the CIHR definition. And, and by now everybody knows it and everybody is quite familiar with all the work that has come uh, with this or behind it and ahead of it. Uh, this one uh, is probably around 2006 or seven. Um, definition that came uh, firmly to say that see, um, knowledge exchange was a dynamic and it iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve the health of Canadians, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the healthcare system. Um, great promise and um, big claims and hopefully we are all working towards it. Um, now the next slide is the actual cartoon or the picture that everybody's familiar with. You have to press it a couple more times. Uh, which uh, it started being a bit on the static side and then the dynamism, the, dy the dynamic aspect of uh, the iterative aspect came forward with that uh, inner wheel that is uh, that 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 um, spun around, and um, and also if you press it one more time, the the reference is there for anybody uh, to look up. But it, this one is an easy one um, to access. The CIHR KT uh, KE model is popular, and it makes some very um, important advances in that it was proposed, it was uh, made public, and it provided a very good um, approach to um, proposal writing so that it, it became one that was required for every proposal that went to, regardless of the theme or the review committee or, or, or the pillar of CIHR, you had to have a knowledge translation section. Um, and this created a very good anchor w from which people started who never would have thought about KE and KT to start thinking about it. Um, so this version that we see now is it has the iterative process of the KT effort and, and the potential of iterative process. Um, now there's been much, many more um, material, more material from CIHR and other researchers that has appeared. There's recent and continuing work um, by KT Canada, which is uh, again a very active group of researchers and trainees. Um, and, and also there is the structure that's called KT Warehouse that has huge amounts of resources available that's public, but also does a lot more active training and uh, summer institutes. Um, so lots of opportunities for people, uh, uh, to uh, researchers and decision makers, they're actually geared to certain populations as well, certain target audiences. And, um, and, and, and a lot of work is going on. Um, I'm not going to uh, be talking about the detail of any of this, but they do contribute to understanding some of the work I'm doing now and, and, and my work that builds on some of these efforts. So I'm just going to be very brief about this overview uh, around KT and KE and the CIHR work. But most of these efforts with the CIHR and other affiliated and related groups of researchers 
um, are on the methods of the synthesis of various types of research. So there's huge discussion and, and a fair bit of literature um, about systematic reviews, for example, and about systematic reviews of only RCTs and how much or how little that actually covers uh, from the available literature and then methodology and lots of very interesting and good debates about how to do synthesis of other uh, methodologies, other methods uh, of data collection, observational, cohort studies, et cetera, et cetera, and, and actually a very um, a recent and, and again quite focused discussion on, on how to use qualitative research and synthesis and meta-analyses of, of qualitative research. Um, and, and there are large um, organizations that are uh, focused on that. Joanna Briggs from Australia has most of the nursing uh, databases on, on research and, and a lot of the, uh, and, and of course there at sort of the other end of uh, the Cochrane Systematic Review, sorry I m mentioned, I forgot to mention Cochrane, which is the, the, the name recognition, the brand that you know most of us know about and I've been part of it since in its inception here in, uh, on the Canadian side. But um, it, so from the RCT being at one end of the highest level of information to, um, to opinion uh, information that's only opinion and, and, and uh, um, narratives of, of what people think, thoughts, and, 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 and the um, sort of effort to synthesize um, that type of information in order to make the most out of it. Um, but the, there's very little on implementation uh, and, and the implementation of uh, the research that is being now considered synthesized, translated, and exchanged, uh, but you know, the exchange still is at that level where um, the action of taking that information to implementation has not. Now, there is recent work, again, uh, to, out of McMaster, and um, Melissa Browers has been doing work in cancer control research, uh, and also Anne Gaglardi actually has uh, recent publications on implementation. Uh, of, but again, because of the way research is done, uh, we have to focus, and her focus is practice guidelines and how to do um, synthesis of knowledge into guidelines that then have implementation uh, features to it and, and built into the guidelines. Now, there's huge amount of literature on clinical practice guidelines. Do they guide practice? Um, how is it? implemented, who follows what, and, and, and that's been in the medical literature, at least, in, uh, for, for many, many years. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so from, from that background, we move on to the next uh, sort of level of uh, the work that I've been involved with, and this is our CIHR team for supportive cancer care. Uh, that was uh, funded uh, about five years ago uh, as part of uh, six teams, um, six other teams that were funded in a in a competition that was labeled in a special. Uh, it's a, it was a strategic initiative titled "Access to Quality Cancer Care," and our team was the team for supportive cancer care. Um, the objectives of that. Um, team were, as you see, to understand and explain theoretical underpinnings of new models of practice to improve patient and family access, um, navigation models across the country, uh, to assess technology-based interventions uh, to improve access to supportive care, to identify, implement, and evaluate valid instruments that screen, assess, and monitor supportive cancer care needs improve health system decision-making through costing analysis and integrate knowledge exchange, synthesis and dissemination throughout the research cycle to facilitate research uptake. So um, this slide uh, shows that um, part of the access to quality cancer care uh, uh, research that we were involved in, and this is an infrastructure grant, so we had funding for trainees and new investigators and, and postdocs, 
uh, as well as small uh, seed funding to uh, do pilot projects and that would lead to large uh, grant proposals. And we were fairly successful in, in generating those um, subsequent uh, grant proposals. Uh, the team was led by Richard Dahl and I and is uh, has a multidisciplinary and multi-site membership. Um, the, um, from Nova Scotia, we have Sandra Cook. From Quebec, there's Mich Dr. Michelle Aubin, Dr. Lise Filion. Ontario's representative Mark Fitch actually was also a CPAC representative on our team and uh, was very um, important to have CPAC uh, involved in, in this endeavor and, and they were providing matching funding to the CIHR funds. So this worked out really nicely in terms of what was going to be intervention and what was going to be intervention research and, um, and the CIHR funds worked towards the research and the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, the Cancer Journey Advisory Group funding went to the action side of things. Um, there was, uh, there's Jill Taylor Brown from Manitoba, Conrad Fassbender from Alberta and Joanne Stephen uh, from BC as well as myself and Richard Dahl. Um, the Next slide shows you how we sort of operationalize the objectives into um, into the work we did. You could tell from the objectives that, for example, explain theoretical underpinnings of new models of care. Navigation models were uh, one that was a large part of our research in the last four years, and uh, and and the. Um, screening for distress in terms of instruments and tools, uh, online technologies and programs in terms of the uh, various uh, ways to make uh, supportive care accessible uh, for people in uh, various parts of the country and, 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 uh, and, and also some of the vulnerable populations that uh, have difficulty and barriers to access. And, um, and, and, and for each and every uh, of, uh, one of these um, projects and programs of research, actually, they were, uh, we infused the knowledge exchange, knowledge translation um, part of it to be, uh, to, 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 take, to be there from the outset. Um, So in terms of uh, knowledge translation objective of the, uh, co this competition, it was, uh, it, it stated that CIHR stated that it is, um, that research teams include healthcare providers and health system managers operating in a policy decision making capacity and have a clear plan for effective and timely knowledge translation. Um, and, and in, in terms of the list of my co-investigators and collaborators, which are even longer and I didn't mention yet, but um, this was a very important point that uh, was actually achieved as we um, moved forward with the proposal in, in terms of the co-investigators that that variety. In fact, other than me, who is a straightforward research scientist, everybody else is a clinician scientist and decision maker at various uh, various levels and, uh, and, and, and sometimes clinicians but not scientists uh, in terms of research. So that was a very good combination and of course we came across from all different provinces um, across the country. So my next one is talking about broad definition of HTA because the, the work that I've been doing in terms of developing this knowledge exchange framework uh, and, and its application to our projects uh, as part of the CIHR team for supportive cancer care draws from, um, uh, from, from the tradition of health technology assessment. Um, the definition here is a simple one, a process for policy research examining short and long-term consequences of individual healthcare technologies. Health technology assessment, again, um, just like I was very brief on the overview of KT, KE, and CIHR, um, 
I will be very equally brief here, uh, but it's, this is not to give you uh, a good rendition of what it's about, but how I, inter uh, how I include it in, in the work I've been doing. Um, HCA is an, in, was an international movement that started late 70s, about 30s, so it's relatively new and young discipline. It was developed in order to inform public policy decision makers about um, best practices. And so this was when uh, clinicians and uh, you know pra uh, medical practitioners uh, were sort of moving and changing practices and finding and new technologies were coming on stream, uh, but there was not a receptor ending end of receptor uptake. And so this was a way to bring together the two um, sort of solitudes and, and put them together in, uh, to, to and, and speak a language that they can both relate to and understand. So, uh, it, it, and it was international, um, and I, be, I was involved in it in the 90s and early 2000s um, as part of a UBC-based uh, program of research. Um, the objective is to inform policy and practice at the services level. So it was specifically made to take it to action. And, uh, and, and some of the uh, areas covered would be guidelines, clinical practice guidelines, and that's where there's a lot of literature. Uh, operations policy at the um, hospital and agency level, uh, which is another route of taking things to action. Uh, and the third one is at the very larger systemic level, funding decisions and public policy. Now, uh, next slide uh, will show you uh, sort of the variety of inter interventions that uh, so so it, when we say health technology assessment it doesn't have to be a drug or a widget um, it could be medical and surgical um, interventions uh, programs procedures tests clinical practice guidelines and some of the system organizational um, aspects and features delivery and planning which means that supportive cancer care fits right there um, and uh, in, in terms of a technology, uh, it, it's kind of sometimes uh, a little foreign for us in, in psychosocial care and oncology to talk about it as a, as a technology, but it is, it's an organizational uh, system. It, it is really um, similar to emergency care, for example, or neonatal intensive care. So again, uh, briefly, the three paradigms of health technology assessment, and this is as much to um, relate to you my sort of disciplinary biases and, and, and perspective. Uh, so the three paradigms that are predominant in, um, in health technology assessment is that of evidence-based medicine. And I'm sure um, most of you have heard of Dave Sackett and the Oxford Group and McMaster Connection and systematic reviews and Cochrane collaboration. So this is where the evidence-based medicine movement in, well, 1993 to be exact, because the Cochrane, International Cochrane, was established at that date and so was our Canadian group. But some of the early impetus uh, in systematic review is Murray Enkin's work in neonatology and maternal care out of McMaster. So I think uh, Canadians have been really very active in this evidence-based medicine movement. Um, and, and economic evaluation. So what happened is the evidence-based medicine uh, interested parties were basically clinicians and MDs and epidemiologists working in the field and, uh, and, and still not making uh, real inroads to the system people. Along came the health economists and brought the cost and cost effectiveness dimension. Then they started making sense. But of course, then you had three different groupings together trying to talk the same language, which was very interesting. And the third aspect is bioethics. So it's the ethical, um, uh, uh, the fair process and accountability for equity items. And, and so all three are really handled within, uh, so what is new with HTA is that, that they're pulling together those three aspects. Um, it is not that they're starting new um, 
areas of research. Health economics has been there forever, uh, and, and ethics has been there forever, but it's the way they weave these three aspects together in tackling uh, a health technology assessment project. Um, so the importance of paradigms and theoretical foundations in modeling cannot be overstated. So um, as I say, this slide is just very, very uh, brief and overview, and, um, but, but it does um, provide some coloring to the work that we've been doing along the lines of knowledge exchange, knowledge translation. If you recall the, the elaborate CIHR wheel and spinning, um, even though it is iterative, it doesn't seem to have um, foundations in, in interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or unidisciplinary. So it's kind of a, a, a good um, tool to have, but it will ex maybe it will explain things the way they happen, but it will not be able to say why they happen this way. And that's where the paradigmatic approach, a paradigm, will give you some idea of why things are happening the way they're happening. In terms of HTA efforts, there's lots of work happening at the federal level. There's the Federal um, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology in Health. Um, Ontario has a couple of groups. There's Theta, which is the Toronto Health Economics and Technology Assessment Group. There's also OTAC, Ontario Health Technology Assessment Advisory Committee. Um, Alberta has uh, Alberta Health Services, and sometimes it goes in and out of the government structure, but it's back into Alberta Health Services. There's an HTA group. Um, and BC, as I mentioned historically, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we had a programmatic uh, uh, a program of research and technology assessment out of UBC. So where did this HTA take me and, and us in general? So what I call this an, a comprehensive and expanded health technology assessment framework um, because it does have the main ingredients. The main focus of HTA actually is that effectiveness evidence. And this is where um, the efforts in knowledge exchange and knowledge translation have been. And, and the concentration on, yes, that is the foundation of uh, moving forward with new knowledge and evidence to uh, guide our practices, policies, and operations, uh, policies, and procedures. Um, however, uh, the economic context, as I explained, came in uh, a, a little bit uh, later, but it's, is, is part of the HTA uh, process and methodology and approach. Uh, and health technology assessment, as I mentioned, does mention bioethics or ethical uh, issues. And however, it, it, it is usually tackled as ethical um, and, and political and uh, legal implications. And it's kind of very, very general um, and doesn't cut to the bone in terms of bringing in evidence on, on these aspects. Actually, a doctoral student of mine spent her thesis talking about how legal evidence is brought in courts uh, in the case of the um, autism and autistic children's uh, class action lawsuit that went all the way up to um, Supreme Court of Canada, and how different that is from where health policy brings in evidence. So there's a whole area of uh, study there. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of um, students in, in the health field looking at the legal aspect, but it has really interesting implications. So this uh, diagram and this framework that uh, I've been working with uh, in, within the HTA realm um, adds to it um, a, a much more focused and highlighted epidemiological context, which is population at risk and population impact. And we hear a lot about these these days and risk factors. And now population at risk actually um, includes not just incidence and prevalence um, and health risk factors, but also the social determinants of health. Again, um, initially, traditionally, um, population at risk epidemiologically is narrowly defined, but as the research on social determinants of health uh, progressed, uh, that is part of the population at risk kind of uh, consideration. And, uh, and, and population impact is how much improvement is the intervention expected to bring forward? 
and, uh, and, and what kind of measures are we going to use to understand this impact? And, and this is where um, a lot of the uh, population-based analysis uh, aims to reach, but in, in, in terms of other methodologies, most of the um, database and a large database, database linkage analysis will actually comb through that utilization data and, and be able to explain quite a bit about uh, implications in utilization. Um, but some of the health outcomes, um, some of that may be captured too. But when it gets to the patient experience and outcomes as defined, and, and I have to remind ourselves that patient-centered care is now the, the, the main focus of our system. Uh, patient-centered care that actually um, improves the patient experience and improves the system experience. So this is, again, not a short order. It's a tall order. And unless we are using the kind of lens that will ferret out some of the issues and explain why these things are happening the way they are, uh, we may be short on solving the problem or finding uh, important solutions. So another um, aspect of my uh, of this approach is that um, when we look at this, we look at it in terms of a multi um, multi level, multi focus. Uh, individual, organizational, and societal information. So let me explain what that means in, in two, two, three uh, minutes. It, again, the CIHR elaborate uh, tool and, and diagram and framework um, covers quite a lot. However, it assumes that research uptake is linear um, and it has a time frame. So you bring the research you internalize the uh, knowledge, you apply it. I don't think life unfolds in that kind of linear fashion. And of course, the information may be there in somebody's head. It may come from research or it may come for, from different um, uh, other sources. And it may, the person may not react on it today, tomorrow, or the next day. So one has to be able to sort out and comb out, tease out those kinds of uh, time uh, lags and, and be able to, so that one can explain what is happening um, in, a, in a better way. So um, especially for program managers who are very involved in, in delivering programs. Okay, so the next one is the TEDS model for, so knowledge exchange decision support model for psychosocial supportive care. Um, what we developed was a, a diagram that uh, did not connote any sort of time order or linear unfolding, et cetera, and, and developed um, very short um, template um, whether you want to call it a tool or a toolkit, it, it is not prescriptive. It doesn't say you must do this. Um, it prompts uh, questions along the important pressure points that you saw in the previous slide, the social context aspect, the major contextual factors that are going to be at play as an intervention is delivered and evaluated. So. Um, in the design and the testing and use of the model, we um, have selected concepts and constructs from several theoretical traditions in addition to the sort of model reflecting the uh, principles of health technology assessment. Rather than be confined to a single theory to explain complex, uh, the complexities of knowledge use. I think the next slide may give you a, a bit of a picture. Um, and you see, uh, other than it being it's iterative, it does not have um, a lot of loops and hoops that, uh, you know, a flow of uh, temporal order. Um, when I say borrowing concepts and reflect and, and, and principles from different traditions, um, as I said, the par paradigm is that of HTA. 
but within that, um, most of the research that we see in terms of um, clinical practice guidelines, for example, in, in changing behavior in practitioner behavior and, uh, and uh, clinical practice, the research is done at using behavioral theory and psychology. Uh, which is good, and it does explain the individual. What we're saying is the individual exists in a social, in a, in a first of all, institutional system, whether it's the agency, the community, the whatever the system that the person is in, in, involved in, and that institution is part of the society and healthcare system. So unless we are cognizant and aware and are able to align the individual's changing behavior. So a lot of uh, practitioners um, try to change behavior, are happy to change, are the instigators of changing behavior, their leaders. Um, however, if it is not supported by their institution and, and, and then it's not supported by the system, uh, they're not going. And we find that having an explicit and a transparent approach that this tool uh, provides will actually prompt these pressure points and ask some questions at the outset. And also um, make sure that all the stakeholders that are maybe not there in the first place, so a clinical leader or um, operations leader is bringing about change at the institution level or at the individual practice level, um, they're not thinking of being broadsided the next year or the next month uh, by barriers and challenges that the system is going to throw that way. So it's better to have that involvement up front. So the prompting of identifying stakeholders and um, leaders um, uh, in, in the various groupings uh, and engaging them is very important. So, so that while psychology may explain individual behavior, um, the you know social learning theories and, and social network theories will uh, will explain um, the um, organizational situation and, and then system theories and complexity theories and economic theories at the system level. So what we've done in our uh, in our tool um, and the template is prompt these without referring to theories, and there's no great theoretical uh, musings in there, but ask those questions that actually tap into those kinds of concepts and, and uh, constructs. Uh, because we find that if you subscribe to one theoretical perspective or one school of, you're c confining yourself, and that's where it's not working, and that's where the early work with HTA has uh, has you know taught us, at least me, that it's it's better to pull together and, uh, and, and be, and, and so what we did was sort of test our ideas uh, uh, around those issues um, by taking our toolkit into uh, the field, which was the CIHR Supportive Cancer Care Team uh, project, and, um, and, and uh, the, uh, the work that was uh, being done by our co-investigators, our, our uh, uh, colleagues and my colleagues and uh, constantly communicating and, ex uh, and and sharing that information. So that this one is the engaging of stakeholders and it's just an example of the variety of stakeholders but the explicit understanding that there's scientific knowledge which is the research uptake and wh whatever methods you want to bring in, whatever methods, that we're not arguing that one method would be better than the other. Um, anything and and on the other side is the all other kinds of knowing which which is <coughs> uh, relating to all the um, per, um, experiential uh, personal knowledge especially practitioners carry a whole lot of patient uh, experience knowledge um, indigenous knowledge um, you know there's uh, there's the, uh, all kinds of types of knowledge and Epistemology is not where we're going to go now, but that's the allowing for that type of rich information. Actually, um, the way I discuss the, the template, although it's a template, it's actually a thick description um, approach which anthropologists use when they go into the field. Um, and they just go with their pad and pencil or maybe all the 
spiffy new electronic equipment these days, um, and they just take field notes. And this is really uh, the approach is to take field notes to explain that connectivity with the, the organization and the system of individuals who are leading um, new uh, approaches and new programs. So the next few minutes I'll spend on talking about some how we um, apply the model in, in three different situations. And, and, uh, and I guess the references are there. Um, two out of the three are published. The third one is under review. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to uh, say a whole lot about uh, the uh, research <coughs> projects themselves, uh, but uh, but pull out some of the information that was generated from from applying this approach and the transparent uh, iterative way of prompting and recording specific aspects. So um, the first one is um, I think the next slide. Uh, is again um, sort of the multifaceted social context I wanted to uh, point out. Uh, again, this is what it means in one instance. You may find another multifaceted social context in your particular, um, but, but it, in institutional structures, and that's very, very important. I heard somebody say the other day that um, the effort at the the impact of institutional and organizational structures and what happens there is so important and so immense that you know individual heroes trying to forge a new path are, are actually um, very well meaning but you know you need to have that kind of intensity to understand and and, and balance with the institutional side of things the geography we all know about that in Canada in particular uh, culture and um, and social re relationships and the project team is sort of there prompting about uh, those kinds of aspects um, so uh, how can we align the disparate knowledge of the stakeholders to obtain the best project results is the intent of this um, slide um, okay, so the Cancer Transitions Program was at the very, very early outset when we started applying. So we spent some time developing this um, template with the theoretical underpinnings and stuff and went out to work with our colleagues in the field. So the Cancer Transitions Program was also very, very early days. Um, at this point, there are many, many uh, Canadian sites that have taken it on and uh, and are still working with it. And um, this came from the wellness community in the U.S. It was a very well developed, very well resourced uh, program in the sense that it had very nice glossy binders and brochures for the patient participant, for the instructor, for the manager, for the lead, etc. And um, was um, uh, was used in the Canadian setting. Um, and the um, so the the ones that we actually there were five sites that we worked with at the beginning. Uh, th three sites uh, agreed to be part of the research project in terms of writing the paper. Five sites participated in the research project, but from the from the three sites, one is Northern BC, one is West Coast BC, and one is Urban Quebec. Um, and and it was interesting to find that. Uh, the uh, way the program was implemented, uh, even though with the same uh, resources and tools, um, turned out to be quite different kinds of interventions. There were still cancer transition programs looking at psychosocial education, uh, nutrition, and exercise, uh, but the, the, the audiences they served, uh, the locations they were working from, and, uh, and 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 the structure that supported them was so different. Um, and, and so what happens is at the end of this kind of pro um, project, uh, one does a, an outcome evaluation and pulls together or s keeps separately and, and looks at some of the uh, health status changes or whatever. And then may say it worked, may say it didn't work. Um, and uh, because really there was no hit, homogeneity in the 
input process output and so what happens is at the end you get results that uh, you may not be able to explain uh, certainly you wouldn't be able to explain why they happen the way they happen so with this kind of approach you're making transparent some of the process and implementation issues and implementation issues are going to determine some of the outcomes and implications for uh, in, uh, future service delivery. So geographic diversity um, affected uh, strategies for program promotion, recruitment, and means of access. Um, the, uh, I mean, one thing that comes, and I remember quite uh, clearly and personally some of the conversations we had uh, as we were doing this. Prince George, for example, did not uh, think that their audience, uh, the, uh, uh, were the types that signed up for things six months in advance or six weeks in advance, they were latecomers. So they only promoted it for two weeks before the start of the program, and 75% of the people that signed on came on the second week. So that proved that, you know, but on the other hand, uh, in Victoria and in uh, Quebec, they were doing different, uh, you know, they were taking different approaches to promotion. That has a lot of implications for what they find at the end. Uh, professional and organizational capacity is very interesting too and, and variation at the three sites. Um, access to qualified and experienced prof um, professionals in terms of the, the fitness, the exercise part. Um, it, you know, a, a fitness instructor in the YWCA is excellent, but they don't do therapeutic uh, exercise and, and therefore, and it was difficult to find uh, uh, that the right professional in in different in the different settings they have different issues, um, and it, more importantly to me, different types of knowledge and evidence was considered by the program leads uh, to address organizational capacity. Um, so community culture inclusivity are the other two I items, and I'm not going to dwell on these at length as I'm running out of time, but. Uh, this was a, a very early piece of work, and uh, and and in, in terms of the voices heard, which is my uh, next slide, um, we were quite happy that service institutions, clinicians, and patient voices were being heard. Now we were working with only the leads, the managers of the programs, so this did not the the template was not being used by the various hierarchy and, and, and certainly not the um, clinicians and patients, but the managers were reporting about the clinician voices and stuff. So it was, um, it was very interesting how we actually mapped the differences, the different ways of implementation and what could be learned from that. Uh, the contextual factors, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, next slide is the uh, geography, culture, and social relationships. Uh, a word about social relationships is uh, the the level of support needed from the research team and the experience of experts participating, the exercise and diet uh, and stuff. The the way uh, the individual capacity in that location was interacting and developing that social relationship in delivering the program was uh, important and. Uh, um, I remember the Prince George group um, that had said that the population was not uh, does not respond to sharing their feelings and talking about personal. So they called it an education program as opposed to a psychosocial uh, support program. Um, those kinds of things are very very important. And yet, when you do your analysis without that information, you write a paragraph under limitations and say. We didn't know this, we didn't know that, so we can't come kind of explain firmly why we have the outcomes that we've measured, but uh, we know that things were, uh, happen. The next one was the cancer navigation programs, and um, again, is the first one, the cancer transitions, was aimed at patients. This one was aimed more in, uh, to the health professional. It was a system focus. And again, uh, there were many, many uh, navigation programs that we had as part of our program of research, but the two that we uh, 
compared and contrasted with the template with the KE model was one in Nova Scotia and one in BC North. Um, both had large uh, rural populations and navigation was an important aspect. The very, very short um, conclusion in a nutshell or summary in a nutshell is that um, the uh, professionals engagement of nurses in Nova Scotia played out quite differently um, than uh, there was no professional uh, in nurse. In, in the, there was a nurse navigator in the north that basically navigated the system for the health professionals and as opposed to the and, and the health professionals, the physician, the other people involved in, in care, whether it was the uh, oncologist, radiation, medical, et cetera, along the way, were actually navigating the system for the patient. What the nurse navigator did was coordinate and make sure the continuity of care. And that was as a direct result of the constraints of health workforce structure and and, and funding and all of that. And it was very, very interesting to see how that played out and, and, and what kind of results in terms of patient experience and um, system experience resulted from that. Um, and the last one in, in my uh, list is the navigation, uh, the, the using the template to uh, evaluate this time. Uh, Next one. Uh, okay, this is the, the last of the three, and and the uh, online support group work uh, being done by uh, Dr. Joanne Stevens and a, a, a cross-country group of co-investigators from almost every province uh, had been done as pilot work uh, from 2007 to 2011. And, um, and and now it was time to scale up and, and, and see how that could be integrated into the system. Uh, part of that uh, re large research group and, and application group implementation, they were, they were the program uh, delivery people, uh, pilot program, uh, was to see how they can actually I enhance their communication and KE activities with a workshop. And since they were going to do the workshop, we said, oh, can we use the, this approach to actually understand we were not going to evaluate the online support groups. We were going to evaluate how the, um, uh, the workshop as a tool for knowledge exchange was going to work out. And, and so what we did with pre and during and post uh, questionnaires that were filled in, the pre and the post and and the follow up uh, the follow up was online the pre and the post was face to face as they uh, and it's not a large number they had that many attend attendance to the workshop they, these were psychosocial supportive care rehab care leads from across the country who were invited and selected for their particular positions uh, the process was that they had been sent um, some research evidence in advance and they came to talk about it in this workshop format, a one-day workshop. What was interesting was, we, and, and using our template approach, um, we confirmed uh, what is starting to appear in literature, that um, middle and higher level uh, executives and leaders are accessing research evidence. They even have resources in their organization to help them access and they do it themselves, and they may even be contributing to some of that literature. Um, what they really wanted and, and got out of the face-to-face -face workshop was that interaction with colleagues to understand the implementation issues which do not show up in these uh, research, scientific um, research evidence uh, papers, and, and wanted to understand uh, issues of resources and, and sustainability and, and, and social relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very interesting that they actually thought that was time well spent when they did actually um, were able to uh, accomplish these things. Um, and, and, and by and large, um, 
if a measure such as how many actually signed on to do this in their own jurisdiction, uh, it was very um, successful because a large majority did actually sign on. Uh, so whether it was because you know the scientific evidence was stellar in the beginning, um, or was the workshop and, and exchanges with colleagues and understanding some of the very economic and uh, structural issues was was helpful. I think I think it was. So um, that's that. I will leave you with one. Um, Next one, I just talked about this. Um, I, I like this one. This is a bit of philosophy. And uh, Bertrand Russell, back in, uh, I don't know when he said what what is quoted there, but hopefully it wasn't 1872. He was born then. Uh, if a man is offered a fact which goes against his instincts, he will scrutinize it closely. And unless the evidence is overwhelming, he will refuse to believe it. If, on the other hand, he is offered something which affords a reason for acting in accordance to his instincts, he will accept it even on the slightest evidence. The origin of myth is explained this way. So there's a lot of myth going around, um, and I'm very, very aware that uh, you're, you're not going to convert somebody who's thinking exactly the opposite, but engaging and um, including them in some of the early and, and, and knowledge uptake exercises is a neutral terrain and, uh, and, and, and one even philosophically opposed or personally opposed to uh, directions is, is al always there to discuss knowledge and knowledge, um, understandings of knowledge and application of knowledge. It's not a personal threat. So that becomes a tool for social transformation. So, um, so the, I think the uh, approach be, becomes a knowledge, the knowledge ecology, the template is the knowledge ecology of each intervention and site as defined by its patient needs, service availability, and structural supports. Those are the sort of foundations for taking into consideration. So um, I'm not doing very well for time, but I still have five minutes or six minutes for questions. So I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Armani. Um So we're just going to unmute the mics, and hopefully everything goes OK. It's going to be a bit uh, troublesome to try here. Otherwise, um, I leave it to the floor. OK, any questions out there on the on cyberspace? No? Any questions here in, in BC, in Vancouver, in the group? Well, I'm really, I'll, I'll jump in here. It sounds like a very interesting framework. And it, it, to me, as I listen to it, it sounds like you've taken some theoretical approaches, like maybe intersectionality, relational autonomy, put in some ethnography or qualitative approaches to look at the context, and you sort of pushed it also into like a program evaluation framework as well. So we've got all this great approach and understanding. Have you moved the framework to, okay, here's how you actually roll it out in relation to a program or an intervention. How do you actually do this now <laughs> that you've got this great approach? Well, uh, the I, I'm hoping that because of the way the template would be used and applied that, and by the way, I'm really impressed with your summary of what it is and, and actually it, it, it reflects your understanding and your disciplinary and, and, and whatever appears important to you. So that's great. <laughs> and I wouldn't have explained it that way, but that's the whole thing. It, you internalize it in the way that makes most sense to you. And, and once you do, I, I think with the exercise as um, more and more, for example, if um, the CEO, is, and I'm just example and the executive director and the manager all worked with this approach and 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 then started um, talking about it uh, it is much more likely that then they will have how they can engage the rest of the group and and be able to then uh, implement things uh, but it, it it is 
very important to have that early understanding of barriers that are going to, as I said earlier, broadside you. And, and this is where, um, I mean, as a new researcher, when I started, I thought, what's the matter with people? I do excellent research. Why can't they run with it? And actually, the HDA research that I did was, actually, was set up to uh, be funneled, not to government, actually. They did pay attention, but people like the um, College of Physicians and Surgeons and, and hospitals and health authorities and, and, and all of these players. Uh, but it, it isn't the wonderfulness of the research is not going. The wonderfulness of the research has to be aligned with the mindset and the structural. And the structure at, at the meso and macro levels are so important. I mean, there has to be incentives for people to change behavior, but if, imagine you're asking them to change entire systems, um, and, and if you do not have the kind of uh, presentation that's going to make sense to them and include them and show the benefits for them, um, it's not going to uh, it's, it's not going to fly. So I think if it's done um, in a multi-level way, it will be. Um, it, you know, the, it would not, I do not think that the template actually will tell you how to do your particular uh, project, uh, but it will certainly bring you as close to doing that as possible in terms of making sure that you have taken the pulse of the, the, the most challenging situations. Okay, um, any other questions? Well, uh, there doesn't seem to be any other questions. David, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I know that we have another session scheduled in April, so look forward to the email. Otherwise, I think we're done for the day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.